What an energized and happy bunch we have this afternoon, and for what good reason are we energized and happy? It's a delight, a just pure delight, to be here with you today at the very edge of a new beginning for cancer research at MIT. I want to start just by offering a little bit of thanks, and it's thanks to Gail Gallagher and Sue Lester, who are the empresarios that created this beautiful environment. We're at You know, some of you might have noticed that here in this wonderful ballroom, we're actually on a parking lot. So Sue and Gail always do a great job, but it's a particularly great job to create this wonderful environment for us today. Um, Dana laid out for you the many ways that the Koch Institute plays to MIT's fundamental strengths. We have a passion for applied technologies. We have um, an instinct for collaborating across disciplines. And we have a willingness, actually, we, see, we have a passionate hunger to push the frontiers of knowledge. On that foundation, there can be no question that the Koch Institute will drive some very important change, a revolutionary change in cancer research and well beyond cancer research itself. So to explore that idea just a, a bit this afternoon, I want to highlight what the Koch Institute might ultimately mean, uh, not just for MIT, and uh, not just for the world of cancer research, but rather what it might mean for cancer patients and their families. You know, for as long as uh, people have been writing about medicine, cancer has been steeped in dread. In describing cancer around 1600 BC, an Egyptian manuscript simply states, there is no treatment. And to a remarkable extent, that conclusion actually held true for about 3,500 years. But by the middle of the 20th century, of course, advances in surgery and radiation and drug development began to shift that reality. But um, I would say that a number of us here who consider ourselves not so very old, we remember a time when cancer was still unspeakable, when doctors sometimes avoided even saying the word cancer for fear that it might demoralize a patient. I remember when obituaries offered opaque phrases like prolonged illness, and when family members would not only hide cancer from the outside world, but even from one another. And then in 1971 came the federal war on cancer. It began with $100 million, and the White House thought it would take mm, about eight years Looking back, there's a lovely, naive optimism about it. Uh, given how little anyone really knew about the biology of cancer then, it was wonderfully ambitious to believe that it could be unraveled so rapidly. But however unrealistic its budget, however unrealistic its time frame, uh, the war on cancer really did spur incredible progress. It changed the game, mostly because it changed the definition of the goal. Now, a major national effort to defeat cancer may sound like an obvious good to us now, but if you look at what Dr. Vincent DeVita said about this, um, he went on to become the director of the National Cancer Institute. Um, his view, he described what the view is of the war on cancer, I'm going to quote for him, from him. He said, academia was against it, the NIH was against it, and the AMA was against it. That's a good start, huh? <laughs> Now, why was that? He explains that because until then, the NIH never had had a mission beyond supporting basic research. With the war on cancer, all of a sudden, we now had to look at the practical applications. It changed the mission not only of the NCI, but of NIH. In effect, the war on cancer said yes to basic research, but it also and emphatically said yes to real world answers. In short, it created the perfect assignment for MIT. And not surprisingly, the MIT Center for Cancer Research sprang to life within three years of the beginning of the war on cancer. Obviously, today, we have immeasurably more knowledge about the biology of cancer. We also have an array of increasingly effective treatments, including targeted drugs like Gleevec and Herceptin, both of which, for which the foundational science was done here at MIT. Morbidity and mortality have declined slowly and steadily, beginning in the early 1990s. 
While we've made remarkable progress, unfortunately, uh, many cancers remain formidable enemies. And it's against this backdrop, however, that I have deep optimism about the potential of the Koch Institute. The kind of ideas being developed here, from implantable sensors to detect the earliest recurrence of cancer, to research that could pinpoint the triggers for metastasis, to the idea of arming the immune system so that the immune system itself could tackle the cancer. Ideas like these could revolutionize the way we detect this terrible disease, the way we treat it, and the steps we might take to prevent it altogether. Ultimately, the work of the Koch Institute could help change, again, change everything about cancer. It can change the language we use. We hope it will change the emotions we feel. And above all, we hope it will change the outcomes we can count on. But in addition to the work of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research, it will change the way we think about doing basic research in biology quite broadly. Let's be clear, none of us is expecting miracles. We're not expecting the solutions to arrive tomorrow or even the day after tomorrow. But it's hard to imagine a more promising moment to be involved in the fight against cancer. And I can say with some pride that it's hard to imagine a better place to unite the forces of biology with the forces of engineering into a new approach to understanding the diabolical machinery of cancer and figuring out how to dismantle it. The Koch Institute is the right place with the right tools and the right people at the right time to make a remarkable difference. In saying that, it's important to point out that um, this didn't rise full blown by itself. We've been pre preparing for this new approach for a very long time. If the link between biology and engineering is the hallmark of the Koch Institute, it's the very soul of the discipline that we call biological engineering. It's a discipline that was literally invented here at MIT. Our landmark success in this area has set the standard for others to follow around the world and right here at the Koch Institute. Without question, the fact that we are here today is thanks to the extraordinary efforts of many people over many decades. Beyond biological engineering, which I just mentioned, of course, we are also building on the 30-year foundation of the MIT Center for Cancer Research and its simply stellar faculty. It bears repeating for those of you who have heard it before and perhaps those who have not, it's not every cancer center that can claim four Nobel Prizes. The, dis the success of this project also depends on the wonderful support we've received from the NCI and from Dr. John Niederhuber, the director of the NCI. Um, with you and your colleagues at, down in Washington, we share your high ambitions for the future of cancer research. We need to help the nation see that this is a moment to invest in a decisive change. Uh, the help and cooperation of the city of Cambridge has been invaluable. We would not be breaking ground today without the city's partnership throughout the permitting process. And we believe that this addition to the MIT campus will, of course, benefit at MIT, but it's also going to benefit the city of Cambridge. Needless to say, the power of the Koch Institute idea springs directly from the boldness, the creativity, and the drive of Professor Tyler Jacks and the truly phenomenal faculty who have joined together in this new endeavor. And ultimately, of course, uh, we're all here because of the vision, the loyalty, and the magnificent generosity of David Koch. Many of you heard me talk about the Great Circle. Um, this is the astounding concentration of talent and ambition that centers here, right here, at the intersection of Ames Street and Main Street. And it marks the humming intersection of science and engineering. We don't have windows in the tent, but if you look behind me, it's the Koch Biology Building. Chemical engineering, just over there. Biological engineering in Building 1656. The Ray and Maria Seda Center over there, housing electrical engineering computer science. The Parsons Lab, just in that direction, housing the biologically oriented parts of civil and environmental engineering. The New Brain and Cognitive Sciences Building, housing the Pickhower Institute for Learning and Memory, and the McGovern Institute for Brain Research. Uh, the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research over there, and of course our newest uh, member of this circle, the Broad Institute for Genomics Research. With this new building 
And this new Koch Institute, right here, right in the heart, the center of the great circle, we're launching a new chapter in MIT's 21st century. It is exciting to be here to celebrate the beginning of this new chapter with all of you. Now, before we get back to um, our lunch, I want to introduce our newly chosen mayor of Cambridge, Denise Simmons. Um, mayor Simmons is accompanied today by a number of our city officers, City Councilor Craig Kelly, City Councilor Sam Seidel, State Senator Anthony Galuzio, City Manager Bob Healy, City Urban Design Director Roger Booth. All of these people have helped us move this project to the state today, and all of them will be celebrating with us this new addition to MIT and to Cambridge. Let me introduce to you then Mayor Simmons. Good afternoon. President Hockfield, thank you for your very warm welcome. As I was sitting here earlier talking to individuals and they said, how long have you lived here? And I said, 56 years. And they said, wow, that's, that's tremendous. And it is tremendous. But let me just tell you briefly how that was chosen. My mother came from Tuskegee, Alabama, a very little town. And she came here to visit relatives and they took her into Cambridge to see the city. And as she drove over the bridge, she saw MIT and she pointed to the dome and said, that's where I want to live. And I've been here ever since. It's really a great honor to be with you here today as we launch an amazing new chapter in the global campaign to find a cure for cancer. I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the Cambridge City Council, the City of Cambridge, and the City Manager and its, his administration. And I, as I offer my congratulations to MIT for this, for stepping up to the plate in a big way to advance the research and tools needed to combat cancer, a disease that touches every one of us. Cambridge is very fortunate and proud to have MIT in its midst, certainly because it serves as an economic and intellectual engine, but also because it is the principal catalyst in growing Cambridge into the preeminent life sciences hub, and you can hear from, even God thinks so. <laughs> this spot right here must be the center of the hub because nearly every building around it supports the vital enterprise of life science. I know that MIT is the brain trust and magnet underpinning this forward-reaching and life-saving industry. On behalf of the city, I would like to express my gratitude to David Koch for his vision and extraordinary generosity. To Tyler Jacks and his team, we are grateful that you are devoting your life to research. And we will wait with bated breath to learn about your advancements. To MIT, congratulations again, and thank you for your immense contributions to society and to the city of Cambridge.